Hey guys, all right, welcome back. This is Jamie here, um, welcoming you to my coronavirus series of lectures 2020. I hope you're all well and that you're doing okay. Here's what we're going to start with next. Uh, here's where we are in the class right now. You should have had, um, you have your nice lead sheet arrangement that you've already done. So I'm hoping that what we can do is go ahead and maybe develop that a little bit. Uh, but where we're heading is, remember by the end of the semester, you need to have a five horn and rhythm section chart finished. Now, guys, we aren't gonna get to play these arrangements. I'm sorry about that, but it's just kind of how the circumstances came along here is you're gonna have to just Probably what we're going to do is you're going to try to get the best MIDI file that you can make on uh, either if you're using MuseScore or Finale Sibelius. That's what we're going for, to get the best sounding product possible. So I would start exploring some of the things that you're going to have to do to get that going on. You're going to have to write bass lines. You're going to have to figure out how to get a somewhat workable drum sound, okay, unless Liam, you want to record yourself into Pro Tools playing drums or something. That's totally cool with me. But remember, your score and your parts are going to, you want those to be top notch. But you're going to, I'm going to be able to evaluate you based on how that MIDI file sounds. So just know that going forward. So you have your kind of small group lead sheet. We have already talked about transpositions ranges. And you're ready, I think, to start in what's called four-part harmony in jazz arranging and composing. So here's what we're going to do. What does that mean, four-part closed? Well, if you listen, to, here's what I would invite you to do. There was a, uh, a great pianist named George Shearing who made this style of piano playing very, very famous. Actually, George Shearing took this from arrangers. Arrangers like Fletcher Henderson and Duke Ellington uh, early on started arranging this way for the sax section. And what it means, four part closed, means that you have four different, start to think of these as voices. If you think of the sax section, uh, you'd have two altos, two and two tenors, right? Those would be four voices. Now later, Barry gets added into the jazz band. Sometimes in those old bands there were two altos, one tenor, maybe a Barry or something like that. It was not really set until Count Basie and Duke Ellington kind of came along and had a consistently five person sax section. So remember that you got those two and two and those are the two, those are the four voices originally that composers use to uh, use this technique with. Now, um, those might be, that, remember, this could be a variety of different instruments. It all, almost doesn't really make a difference what four instruments are. You could have three violins and two violas, or, or uh, two violins, two violas do this, and it would sound great. Oftentimes when I do pops orchestra charts, I do first and second violins, uh, and then viola and cello. And listen, you got a whole string section playing these voicings, and they're really beautiful. So if you can master this four-part technique, that would be great. It's money in the bank. Um, so here's where we're going with this. I want you to start thinking of some different rules. I, I want you to memorize these, and these are all in the chapter four of your book, uh, four-part closed uh, position writing okay so you need to read through that and you need to play through all these voicings if you don't uh, you're heading for a world of trouble and your project probably won't sound like you want it to okay if you do a lot of this playing and get these four part chords in your mind and under your fingers you're really going to benefit from that so that's your assignment you got to read chapter four now that said I kind of like explaining it this way. There's some rules to doing this. The first rule, all voices have to be 
within one octave. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean that you can use an octave between voice one and four. It has to be within. So it's actually a major seventh is possible. Just think about this. I'm going to play a major seventh chord. Right? Those are four different voices. Seven, five, three, one. Right? And within the other two voices are within that major seven. Okay? So that's one rule that you have to keep. Now, you might be able to get four voices in a major sixth or even a minor sixth sometimes. Okay? That's a, uh, that was an F minor chord in first inversion. Okay? So it's ba, 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 ba. So you have a minor sixth on the outside. The outer interval may vary, but just remember, it has to be within an octave. Now, for instance, if you, if you do this, see what I did there? I did a D minor triad, A, F, D, and then I put another A on the bottom, A. You see how the, there's an A on the bottom and an A on the top? That's actually one voice. So here's the rule. If you double something, at the octave, that's just one voice. It's the same note. Remember, voices are lines of music that are going to continue throughout your, your sax soli or your whatever it is, your four horn arrangement. Okay, so that's the first rule. Remember that one. Uh, the second one is try to maintain some space between those upper two voices. Okay? I have here that you try to maintain a third. Your book is a little more fluid about that. They say a major second or greater. Uh, I like trying to steer towards a third because what that does is it makes your melody pop out more. Uh, when you have a voicing like this, two voices. So when you hear that minor second up in between voice one and two, it clouds your melody. For a moment, the listener's going to go, hmm, I don't know which note it is that's the melody, and it'll really pop out. Now, you might like that sound and be able to use that somewhere as something interesting, but generally in a sax solely, we try to avoid those sorts of things. Okay. Um, so, try to maintain a third, maybe a major second, at least never a minor second. On to the next one. The third rule, you're going to balance color and function within a voicing. We're going to practice some voicings here in just a second. So, um, color, what are the color tones? Nine. 11, 13, right? And if you have a hard time knowing what's what in a chord, then you need to practice your piano a little bit and find, like for instance, if I say D7 sharp nine, what's the color tone in that? You better know what the sharp nine is. What's an E sharp or an F natural, right? So you gotta be able to know those quickly and find those on the piano, um, okay? So nines, th 11s, 13s. And they're going to vary in different chord types, right? On a dominant chord, you're going to have all sorts of different kind of nines. Sharp nine, flat nine, natural nine. You can have probably sharp 11. If you have an 11, it's probably a sus chord. If you have a 13, it's going to be either sharp, it's going to be flat 13 or natural 13. Uh, you don't have those problems on the other chords. On major sevens, it's just nine or 13, right? On minor chords, you're going to have 9, 11, or 13, okay? So you try to balance in one chord. Remember, we're going to have four notes. You're going to balance color and function. That means the listener needs to hear the chord type. They're going to know it's a minor seventh because you're going to have those guide tones in the voicing, okay? 
Uh, now, if all you have is, I'm going to play a minor seven chord. Or in an inversion. Okay, all I have there is function. If you have too many chords in your sax soli that is purely function, uh, it's going to sound pretty vanilla. Okay. Uh, now, you want to add a little spice, a little flavor. That's where the chord tones come in. See, I put a 6 in instead of a 7 on that to add a little more color. So this is where the book is going to play an important part of you playing through and thinking, ooh, I like that color. Well, I like that. Um, but, listen, if you have too much color in a chord, what ends up uh, happening is the listener doesn't hear the function. So you do have to have this balance. Usually there's going to be a mix of it in your chords. Okay. Uh, you are, here's what I want you to do as you're reading. You're going to listen, you're going to read for and listen. To, you have all these great examples. You're going to do a basic guide tone, a basic tone and guide tone uh, substitutions. So what are basic tones? Do you remember what those are? You don't? Well, I'll tell you. Basic tones are the root and the fifth. They're the most basic tones of all. They give no chord quality, but sometimes you can use them, okay? You can use them as kind of filler. Uh, sometimes they'll be in the melody. So then uh, what, we, what we do is if they're on the inside of a chord, we can say, well, I don't like the fifth there, so what note is right next to the fifth? The sixth, so that's the substitution. Sometimes there might be a root in your voicing. Well, what, what sounds better than the root? What notes are right next to it? The seven or the two, okay? So you can use those interchangeably once in a while in voicings, and we'll kinda discover that when we're building some voicings, okay? The fourth point, melody is most important. If your melody is being clouded by your hip harmonies underneath, you haven't done your job. In fact, you've done too good of a job. Your voicings are too hip. Your book talks about page 70, uh, talks about density and tension. Density is how close, how close together your voicing is. Maybe your, chord need, your chords need to maybe be more spread out. And then tension is maybe you have too many of the color tones or uh, maybe you have too many minor second rubs inside your voicing. So that's something that you're going to want to start thinking about. Now, this is when, when we get to a little bit more faster lines. Point 0.5 takes effect here. Avoid repeating notes. Um, a while ago, there was a saxophone player in one of our bands here, and he was taking arranging with me. And I told him, you really, really want to avoid repeated notes inside a sax solely. So that means as they're playing a line, bo bo do do ba do da dee 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 da dee bo do do da. Did you hear that? Dee 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 da da dee ba do da. If it gets too fast of a tempo, saxophonist or any instrument really has a hard time repeating those notes. Try to avoid that if you can. There are going to be ways that you can get out of that situation when it gets faster. And the first way is uh, page 83. It, for a, just a second, you're going to swap notes between voices. I'll let you read about that and explore that. You need to know what that is, okay? Now, um, I'm going to do this. Just give me a second to get changed over here and we're going to build some voicings. Welcome to my uh, second half of coronavirus 
lecture number one. Um, we're in four part closed harmony. What I'm gonna do right now is take you through some voicings and get, let you get my thinking on how to build these, okay? There are infinite ways to build these chords up here, guys. So, uh, and then when you get satisfied with what you have, then you think, oh, well, how can I reharmonize this? So I realize that. My point is to get you thinking about what's a clear voicing and how does that work. Okay, so uh, let me just make sure I can see this. You can see everything here. Let me zoom in on it a little more. Oh, wrong way. Okay, so I hope you can see that. Um, what I did here is I put some melody notes up here. Now I do a couple of different things. You're going to harmonize things differently based on whether you have a color tone in the melody or if you have a basic tone or a guide tone in the melody. So look at this first one. We have, I'm, we're gonna do this. I'm gonna go through the different kinds of chords. So what are the three major kinds of chords that we're gonna use? Minor sevens, dominant sevens, and major sevens, right? Two, five, one, or sometimes a six chord. Now, there are others, right? What are they? They're the diminished, and there are the uh, half diminished, right? And, so, well, we could say uh, augmented major seven or minor major seven. So there are various different kind of chords and you need to spend some time on those for you guys who haven't been through jazz theory class yet okay so here's what we're going to do to start building these four part chords all right let's look right here we got a got a g up on top of an f minor so we got a nine what i do is i go okay i got i think what's going to be my next chord tone down well, remember, we, won't, we don't want to do this. We don't want to put the F right next to it. Why? Because we're already kind of, we're kind of violating that rule of what? Avoiding seconds on the top of the voicing, right? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go down and see if I can get the chord tone down a third. Oh, hey, that works great. I put the seven in there right below, okay? Here's the next step. What can we do next? Well, sometimes I like to look to see if you can get another third down. Build your chord on thirds. Oh, that works. We got the fifth, right? Next, let's keep going here. Look at that. That works out great, but you can just go down nine. Okay, so we get a nice sounding chord there. That's one option. Let's look at another option. Now, here's where we get into what we talk about substitution tones. So, the thing about this chord is you do have color here, and look at what else we have, though. We have the third. And we do have the flat seven, right? So we have function. And then what's your C? That's a basic tone, that's the fifth, right? So we have kind of a balance of stuff going on here. We got the collar, and then we got the function, two, two of them, and then a basic. So really we have more function here than color. Here, what if we wanted to make it more colorful? Ooh, let's try this. Let's stay with this. here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to substitute I'm going to substitute the 7 with a 6. Put that C back in there. Okay, keep that A flat right there. Ooh, so here's what I've done. I've done a guide tone substitution. 
because actually that D is what? It's a six. So I now have a six and a nine. So here's the difference between those sounds. There's the first one. There's the first one. Here's the second one. So to my ears, this one has a little bit more function to it. Now, there are a lot of things that come into play here. We have no idea. If this is a big line, we have no idea what came before it or comes after. We're just building chords. So that may affect which one of these works better. Okay. Now, let's say, oh, I want to do this. I want to have even more color. I wanna, I'm going to put an 11 in there. Well, here's where we've gone too far. We have 6, 9, and we have 11. We don't have any third. We don't have any seventh. So it's very ambiguous. And this is an example of taking your tension level too far. OK? Capiche? So I'm going to put that back in. These are both really nice voicings. Let's do another one. So look at this one has what in the melody in a D minor 7? It's got a guide tone. So here's what I do. I think, OK, I'm going to think coming down is, can I put in a chord tone coming down? A third? Yeah, right there, there's the fifth, OK? Um, Come down another third. OK, there's the third. Mm -hmm. OK, there we go. We have a chord, and we've just stacked it up. Four part close. Nice enough, right? But let's examine what we have. We don't really have any color, do we? So what I think is, hmm, what's the most I mean, it's either going to be one of two tones. We have the basic tones in here. We have one and five. One of those got to go. My first thought is to do this. This is probably the best option. Erase the root, substitute it with the nine or the two, right? And you got this nice classic sound. It's almost, actually, you could rewrite that. You could use that as an F major 7 voicing, couldn't you? But here, the root is a D, OK? Here's another option. And let's go back to that original voicing we had. That, and you know what? That'll get you by fine. You'll use that a lot. You don't always have to have the hippest voicings. Um, it might depend on what's going on in your tune. Here's one. I'm going to erase the fifth and put in, ooh, put in the 11. So then you get this. OK, and that's a good voicing, too, because now you have the 11th in it. But sometimes that might not be uh, appropriate. If you're arranging an old swing tune, Moonlight in Vermont, you're probably not going to use that chord. If you're arranging Inception by McCoy Tyner, yeah, you're going to use that all over the place. So it really depends on the style of the tune. OK, let's go to the next one. How would you guys do this? This is a, this is a tough one. This is an E flat minor 6. Remember, a minor 6 has a, just the regular sixth of the scale. So um, you know. You know, the next one down really is that B flat. So here's where you may have to violate that rule of having a third in the top two voices. That's fine, just for one chord. OK. That's probably how I do that one. I just stack it from the six down. Let's see what that sounds like there. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? OK. Now, what are some other ways we can work on this chord? Well, we could say, uh, we don't really need the root. 
let's see what the what the let's see what the uh, seventh sounds like on the bottom. experimenting with these. Now your book is going to have a compendium of different choices of, uh, of sounds, four note voicings. It, for instance, on page um, mm, on page 65, 66, 67, it's going to have a bunch of different ideas for how to score these. All right? And uh, I would, I'm making it your assignment to go and play those on piano. Okay. Um, let's do this. Let's do a couple dominant sounds while we're at it. Okay. Let's erase these. All right. Let's start with a D7. So when you see that right away, and notice how I'm using the grand staff. You all need to get used to thinking on the grand staff and having your, so I'm gonna put it right here. Ooh, the nine, you know colors in the melody. So probably we're gonna have to get enough function in there, right? So that means what? Third and seventh. How do we, well, let's try to come down in thirds first. All right, there's the seventh. Then the next one down, there's the fifth. And there's the third. Pretty good voicing, right? Pretty good voicing. If you look at that, that's really what? An F sharp, half diminished, but it's the upper part of a D7-9 voicing. How can we make that a little bit better? There's not a lot of color. Well, there's color in the melody, so it would be okay on its own. We could do, do this. Let's do a basic tone substitution. Let's put that B in. Ooh, and you get it right next to that. Now, you see what we've done? We've increased the tension level by putting a half step rub in. now have this. We now have more, more color. What was one of our other choices, by the way, for color? Instead of, instead of that, that B, we could have taken the A and gone down here to G sharp, right? So do you see how you can fool around with these voicings? Uh, what if you wanted this? Change your melody note. Ooh, now we have a sharp nine. So do you see how these different sounds, we're spacing them in a way that work? Look, we have a nice gap between the top voices. We have a balance of color and function. This is what you need to learn in your reading, is to go and look at this. Let's do a dominant chord where we have a function note in the melody. Let's, for instance, use a C. That's what? What chord tone is that on an A flat? It's the third. So what do we do first? Let's come down. Come down by thirds if you can. A flat. I mean, let's just get the basic outline of the chord first. This would be just fine. 
just fine as a, as a possible chord type. But what do you, so you have both guide tones, three, seven, and then you have five and root. So really there's not that much color. So what can we do? The fifth, we could do this. This is honestly, this chord, I probably would stay with this if it's in the middle of a line. You might want to get a little bit hipper later. Oop. I'd take out the root probably, and I'd go G flat, F, and then E flat. That's one of your options. to that though is look at this cluster down here so we kind of have a lot of a real tension there well it's dense actually at the bottom of the voicing and then we got a big cap so what else can we do with that let's experiment with this up here we could break our rule of a second and go like this three three nine Seven, five. Okay, that sounds pretty good as well. We could, and you see how many options there are here? We could take that out and go like this. Woo! Let's put a sharp 11 down there. See how many possibilities there are here? How do you learn this? Not by just kind of watching this video and saying, oh yeah, okay, that was cool, and then moving on. You got to go back and live with these at the piano. Okay. Um, there's some obvious ones where you'll have, uh, let's do a G7 with a flat 9 and a sharp 11. Let's put the sharp 11 in there. Okay. So we know we got to have, we got the sharp 11 here. We want to have, uh, we need the third in there. And I put the flat 9 here. Put that there. So sharp 11, 3, flat 9, and then the 7. So I have function, 3rd, 7th, I got my function in there. I, on, when I have two color tones, I know I got to get those function notes in there. Okay. And then, uh, then the color, sharp 11, flat 9. Pretty cool sound. <laughs> one more category. Those are dominants, and they have a bunch of dominants in your book. Uh, if you go to the back, there's a compendium, uh, an appendix. Appendix 4 is a compendium of four note closed voicings. Play through all of those for next week. Okay? What, I'll, what I might do is for the final exam, we'll have you play through some of those for me so I know that you can plan. Okay, one more category here. Um, let's do the major sevens. And guys, I'm gonna let you work on this a little bit for next week. I'll tell you what your assignment is in just a bit. We're going to do major sevens. Let's do an F major seven with a nine. Okay, so what do we do? We kind of go down the chord, see if we can stack it in thirds first. Well, okay, hey, look at 
that, I'll use both bass and couple claps. Okay, what's another way to hip that voicing up? Because that's pretty basic. We have the color, one color tone. We got the function and then a basic. So another way to construct it would be like this. Move that five up to a six. And now you have a nice six nine voicing instead. So here's the first one. Here's the second one. Okay. Another cool voicing is this one. This starts to look almost chordal, and this is actually what we call an ambi voicing. This isn't. This isn't in your book, so this is a little bit of a. Uh, Gary Lindsay special. Um, Ambi voicings, that could that voicing could be anything. Could be an F, could be a D minor 11, could be an E, Lydian, could be, could be a B flat major 9. Okay, so that's why I call that an Ambi voicing. It also has fourths in it. Look at these fourths. Fourths between the D and the A. A fourth between the D and the G. So that's why it's kind of chordal. Okay? Uh, let's do another one. Hard one. D flat, major 7, sharp 11. With F in the melody. Well, you got a you got a, another function tone you could put in. Okay, but we're going down in thirds. The next one would be the root. And then what do we have to get in? We have to get that. That's a great voicing. See how I did that? You actually could. You wouldn't even need that root, would you? Because that's going to be in the bass. So you can substitute out. Just put in another color tone. That's pretty cool. Both guide tones, two color tones on the bottom. That's a cool sounding chord. Right? So I hope you can hear this okay. Let's do one more major seven chord. Oh, here's the, I'm going to do the hardest possible voicing. Uh, let's do G flat major seven. <laughs> With that in the melody note. Why is that hard? Because what's the next note down would be that F. So put it in anyway. I'll put that in and we'll go down the chord. Right, there's your voicing. One, seven, five, six. Okay, so you gotta do something about this. Well, what do we do? What's the substitute tone for a, a seventh? Well, it's the next note down, right, in the mode. That would be, we just make it into a sixth. So it really, becomes a G flat six chord, which is great. It's a great sound. And it helps you out of that situation because what's most important? Say it with me, the melody, okay? Great. Um, you have some work to do. And here is your assignment. I'm gonna show you what your assignment is here uh, in just a second. Your assignment is to look at the end of chapter four at page 90. Page 90 has a list of different tunes. And if you look at all those tunes, all those tunes are tunes that really stick within the key center of the tune. They don't really have any chromatic tones that are hard to harmonize. Uh, for instance, all the things you are. Yeah, that's in there. Alice in Wonderland. Um, Blue Zet. 
those are all tunes that the whole melody is basically uh, right inside the key. You're not going to have too hard of a time harmonizing these. There's not a lot of cr uh, chromatic motion. But what you're going to do is you're going to harmonize all uh, the whole melody. You're going to pick one of those. Now you can't use Cherokee because I'm going to use it right now. Sorry. Um, okay, Cherokee is in B flat. I'm going to show you what you're going to, going to do. So, ooh, let me get to the nail. You are going to put your chord symbols in above the melody. On Finale or Sibelius or Muse score, turn off the chord playback. Those things are raunchy. You don't want to do that. Okay? So we're on B flat major seven. Okay, there are the chord chord symbols, right? So, here's what you're going to do. You're going to harmonize these in four part, four part close. And I want you to show I want to show you how fast I do this. Guys, I don't overthink this. If you're thinking about making each chord the hippest chord you've ever written, that's that's not that's not the goal. What is the goal? To bring out the melody and have a really nice sounding sounding uh, product. Okay, um, so I'm going to come down that third, then the seventh is right next to it, and then the fifth. Good voicing. Okay, keep on coming. Okay, five, three. Now, instead of the root in the voicing, I'm going to put a nine in there. Okay, that sounds sounds pretty good, right? So now what's this is kind of what we're talking about. Um, check this out. This goes up, but to come down, hmm, I have to break that rule of a third. But I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to break that rule just because I want to keep this voice moving up. And all the voices, look, they're kind of moving together. All the time. I'm never going, never going bigger than, uh, well, what my outer interval is major six. Here it's a minor sixth, right? So it's always within that octave. Okay. Ooh, do, do, do. Ooh this is an interesting chord. Well, what do we do? Am I going to do this? Am I going to have that right next to it? Hmm, I don't know. Mm, that to me doesn't sound doesn't sound real Cherokee-ish. Sounds pretty dense, pretty chordal. So I might do this. I might take this. I might just do this. Come down thirds. Okay, I might just do that. Or even leave maybe or an A flat. Maybe. Okay, now I'm coming down. I'm going to create this, a B flat 7 voicing. Ooh, I'm going to try something here. Look, I'm going to put my color, my guide tones in here because I know that's color. 
That's the 13. Put my third and third and seventh there. Ooh, I can, I have one more place for color. Ooh, how about this? I'm gonna put a C flat in there. So. Ooh, see how that C flat creates the tension there? I'm kind of choosing to put in some color there. So you see how I did that pretty quickly? It's going to take you a little bit longer probably, right? But, um, but if you do your studying in the book, you're going to be fine. So that's your assignment for chapter four, is to go through a whole melody and, and do this. And just for our, the sake of clarity, uh, I, I'm going to make this do on Mar uh, Monday, March 30th, okay? That'll be the due date for this. Here's what you need to do. You need to do this on Muse Score or Finale Sibelius. You need to have this all, what I would say is to do it um, on four separate lines. And what I would say to do is do alto one, alto two, tenor one, Ten or two for now. Okay, build the saxophone notes, and you're actually going to put in each note from top to bottom. I would go chord to chord and figure out what they are. If you need some help on this, feel free to give me a call. Okay, send me a PDF. Guys, try not to do this. Try not to have your melody take up nine pages. Okay, so find a way to get your score onto three or four pages tops. If you can do it in two, that would be great by making uh, four measures per system or something like that. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, please send that playback to me, the MP3 file. Uh, if you want to just check how it sounds, create a bass part too. Put in, put in bass notes, right? Half notes, whole notes so that you can hear the what you write against the bass note. Okay, I hope you're all well and safe. Um, I really miss you guys. I'm not gonna get to see you much face to face and that, that really bums me out. I'm, uh, I was really looking forward to seeing what you create for the end of the semester, but I'm hoping that you can use these arrangements as we go forward, okay? Uh, your arrangement, be thinking about what you wanna do for your chart. Okay. If you're going to use your old melodies somehow, uh, we can talk about it. Okay, thanks guys.